young Marine, enlisted when he was 14 years old. Went to Vietnam, 15, got killed uh, shortly after he arrived in Vietnam. That's an incredible story. The death of Dan Bullock is still somewhat mysterious. Phil Kastner has been tending Dan Bullock's grave the last two decades. I just knew that I wanted to do this. Dan's legacy should be remembered and honored, like all, all the veterans. A part of the American story is the evolution of America's armed forces and the overlooked narrative of the black service member. Often, in the face of racial discrimination, many African Americans volunteer to serve under the most challenging circumstances, only to prevail heroically. One such American was Dan Bullock. Born in Goldsboro, North Carolina, he dreamed at an early age of becoming a pilot a police officer, a Marine. On May 8, 1969, Private First Class Dan Bullock arrived in Vietnam. One month later, he was dead. As the youngest American killed during the Vietnam War, PFC Bullock has never been fully recognized for his service to his country. This is his story. We grew up together. That was my best friend. Yeah. And everybody loved him. You know, he was wonderful. He was smart, intelligent, and very adventurous. We had mm -hmm. long distance trucks that we would put match stems on, mm -hmm. the big matches for the officers and the little ones for the regular <laughs> soldiers. <laughs> right. And we would get in the backyard and we would play war. After Dan's grandmother died, the family moved to Brooklyn, New York where Dan's aspirations and dreams of joining the military grew. At the age of 14, Dan Bullock would make a decision that will alter the course of his life. He just wanted to make a difference and change, and ever since he was little, he always wanted to go into the military. It's not clear who helped him alter his birth certificate, because my grandfather said he didn't, you know. But Dan was so very mature for his age, and we was all proud of him. I met Dan Bullock in October 1968 in boot camp. And uh, he didn't make it in the platoon he was in, so they put him in my platoon. And I really hadn't met him yet, but I saw him for the first time then. Uh, after, uh, after he failed a couple of runs, uh, we were beginning to get punished as a result of him uh, not keeping up. And some of the Marines, white Southern Marines, uh, wanted to give him a blanket party. I overheard them talking about giving him a blanket party and I t interceded on his behalf. Uh, I was from Brooklyn and I knew then he was from Brooklyn and I felt an obligation to try to help him out. The fact that he was only 14 years old and it was something that uh, he probably needed to be about 18 or 19 in order to be able to do. It was the toughest thing I ever did and anybody could ever do is go through Marine Corps boot camp. And uh, I don't think he was mentally ready for it yet. I didn't know a lot about Dan because we never, in boot camp, you don't get a lot of opportunities to talk. But I did realize eventually that he was, he was determined. He loved the Marine Corps. He loved his family. And uh, he tried very hard. He tried hard. And I could see that, uh, that he needed help. 
the day of graduation from boot camp is the day that we all get to meet and celebrate our victories as far as uh, graduating from boot camp. So I had an opportunity to speak with him then and a few other Marines, and we're all looking forward to just going home, just going home and being with our families. Uh, I didn't actually go to Vietnam, but Dan did. Well, the situation in uh, early 1969 uh, in Vietnam, uh, this was a period when uh, we had reached uh, peak troop strength. Uh, we, we maxed out at around 400 and I mean, 545,000 troops in the Military Assistance Command Vietnam. Uh, and so this was the moment when uh, the United States was bringing its maximum strength to bear. The war had gone on for uh, over three years at a very high intensity by this point. And uh, it seemed clear to everyone on both sides uh, that the United States was not going to win a victory in the traditional sense of the word. Uh, by this stage. Uh, negotiations were underway with the North Vietnamese and so this was a period where the United States was fighting for uh, a, uh, an outcome where the South Vietnamese government uh, would eventually be able to go it more or less alone. So as the phrase um, was uh, at the time, the United States was, was fighting for time. And so in Quang Nam province, uh, where Dan Bullock was to serve um, with the uh, 1st Marine Division, this was one of the uh, critical areas in the country and had been um, uh, since the United States had really gotten involved in a big way in 1965. Uh, the Anwa Valley, which is uh, south and west of the city of Da Nang, uh, was a heavily populated, uh, very uh, uh, fertile basin um, that had produced a lot of food, uh, a lot of manpower. There was also a uh, marine combat base called the Anwa Combat Base at the sort of southern edge of the valley. Um, this is where Dan Bullock would eventually be stationed. Dan Bullock and I landed in Vietnam together. Uh, we were assigned to the same unit. Uh, second platoon of Fox Company had lost uh, most of a platoon. So they took replacements and put them in this one platoon, second platoon. Uh, there were only 11 men left after a Mother's Day mortar attack. So uh, we were in the rear at Anwa Fire Base. And that's, uh, we, we didn't go out to the bush, we were waiting for the men to come back. And in that time, we got to know each other, not too well because Dan was protecting a secret. But uh, we did talk. He, um, I befriended him because the men who were in the field, who came back to the rear, didn't like Dan for some reason. They didn't know, they didn't know what, what it was, but they were kind of angry with him. Uh, he didn't do anything, he didn't speak. He, he was okay. He and I would spar. He and I would go to chow together. And I felt like a big brother to him. At this uh, point in the war, uh, the troops that were fighting, the American troops and Marines and soldiers and airmen and, and, and uh, uh, naval personnel, uh, were a mix of uh, drafted people and people who had volunteered. If you, let's say, entered the service and you were 18 or 19, uh, you know, you'd go to basic training and you would go through you know, the system that would, you know, turn you into, you know, a, a, a basically, you know, a private or the equivalent of a, a private first class uh, within a year or so. Now, a lot of those uh, soldiers or Marines uh, were, in fact, um, sent to Vietnam pretty much out of their, you know, advanced uh, infantry training. So they hadn't been in the service you know, probably more than a year or so. Uh, and they were put into, um, yeah, they were put into a dangerous situation um, almost from the moment they stepped off the plane. For a lot of these uh, young Marines like Dan Bullock, uh, it might have been, you know, several weeks before they actually saw action. Um, but when they 
did start going out on patrols and start participating in these operations, you know, they were expected to pull their weight, you know, from the moment they stepped outside the wire. He would go out on these small patrols. We'd check out bunkers. We'd uh, check the wire to make sure the enemy didn't cut it. We'd, we'd be on uh, bunker duty at night, filling sandbags during the day. And all this until the company came back. When they came back from the Arizona Territory, um, they were in no mood for new, new men, myself included. They did not like breaking in new men because uh, we didn't know the sights, sounds, smells, or what to do in, uh, during an attack. These are all combat veterans. And uh, for some reason, uh, what, which we found out later, it was uh, uh, Dan did everything he was told to do, and yet he was the last person picked for uh, bunker duty or whatever. And the day of the attack, we, uh, he and I were sparring, and he dislocated my thumb. I couldn't use my rifle that night, so I was sent to guard tanks. He went to the bunkers, and uh, that night the enemy broke in. They used satchel charge, which is sacks of explosives. Which they tossed onto the bunkers or into the bunkers and blew them up, and that, uh, then the other ones could infiltrate. They were trying to blow up uh, uh, stores of ammunition, like artillery shells, and if they could, planes or whatever, they didn't, they didn't really get through. Some of them broke through. One of them actually made it into the regimental area. But Dan's bunker and everyone in it, the four men were in it, Bunn, Honeycutt, Eggensdorfer, and Bullock were all killed, probably instantly because none of them got out of the bunker. The enemy that got over the, bump, uh, the bunker, uh, we heard later, uh, had fired into it just to make sure they had killed everyone in it. So their possibility of gunshot wounds and uh, explosion. So none of our men could get to that bunker because, uh, you know, they kept the enemy away, but there was a trench line behind it and that's where the men were fighting from. So in the morning, we had to hold positions, or they did. I was still at the uh, tanks and uh, another unit of Marines came in and removed the bodies. So none of us ever saw him or Eggenstorff or Bunn and Honeycutt. We didn't see the bodies. There was something about Dan that just made me want to pick on him. Uh, I don't mean that in a bad way, but come on, let's go. He wouldn't talk, but, but he, would do, he would do other things. He was friendly, but he wouldn't speak and we couldn't. The other guys gave up, but I kept saying, where are you from? He'd say, New York. You don't sound like you're from New York. <laughs> and, and he would figure out all kinds of ways to tell me he was from New York. Uh, he never let on that he was 15. So that's the whole thing. There was something about him that made me want to protect him when the other men were just outright um, aggressive toward him. So he and I were, were friends, although we didn't speak much. He spent a lot of time writing home. He didn't, uh, he didn't share his letters with anyone. Uh, but I thought this was normal behavior. I hadn't yet been in combat. A few weeks after he was killed, a reporter came in. The big story was on, uh, was on the front page of the New York Times. A uh, 15-year-old is killed. Then we realized, yeah, it all all just fell into place that Dan was 15. He had enlisted at 14. He had gone through boot camp at 14. To me, that makes it amazing that anyone, any human alive can make it through boot camp at 14 is really impressive. That he held a secret is also impressive, but it explained why I felt like he was a younger brother and others felt like he wasn't supposed to be there. He didn't belong there. The day I found out that Dan was killed, I was in Cuba in a foxhole. 
there was a, a Marine that got a newspaper from home. And he was in boot camp with us. And his mother sent him the New York Times without knowing, I guess, that uh, she, he knew Dan and he was on the front cover. So he ran over to my hole with tears in his eyes. He's crying. He said, look, Mac, look. And I looked at it. When I saw it, I cried. And uh, that, was, that was horrifying because nobody knew until that point how old he was. When I realized he was 14 years old, I had this, this, this terrible feeling. And, uh, and then when that Marine said to me later on, not that same one, but you ever thought if you hadn't helped him, he might still be alive? So I have been uh, touched by that from that day on. I knew that there was something I had to do. I went on a mission to find his family. It took my wife and I 22 years to find his family and his burial site. And then when we found him, we found that he, he was buried without a headstone for over 31 years. Then the mission was to make sure he had a headstone. Not long after, recognition for PFC Dan Bullock came from an unexpected source. I got a call from uh, Sally Jesse Raphael about the headstone. She read in the paper about my efforts to get Dan recognition and he was buried without a headstone. Her head of security, Mr. Al Bland, is a combat Marine, Vietnam. He took the story to Sally with tears in his eyes, I'm told, and told her, we have to help this guy. So I got a call from their offices and they wanted to know if she could pay for the headstone. My wife and I and the rest of our foundation led 2,000 people, Marines and other branches of the service from Brooklyn all the way to Goldsboro, North Carolina with police escorts in every state to put it on his grave. I got a call later on from a fella named Steve Piscatelli. And he says to me, uh, I just read about you in the Vietnam Veterans newspaper and I understand you, uh, you want to create a monument for Dan. And he says, uh, I, I was with him when he got killed. Not only that, I'm a sculptor of war memorials and I would love to do his monument. So I asked him, I said, is there anything you can show me that I can see that would make me want to go along with you? Because I was looking for sculptors at the time. He asked me, was I familiar with Bristol Township, Pennsylvania? So I told him, yes. He said, in front of the municipal building in the police department in Bristol Township, Pennsylvania, there's a monument that I sculpted there. So I told him I would go see it. I took my wife and we drove over to see it and we cried because it was incredible. It was him holding one of his men who died in his arms in Vietnam. And at that moment, I decided that Steve had to do the monument. He had to. So we commissioned him to do Dan's sculpture. When I came home, I tried to get back into life as I knew it before, but I couldn't. Uh, I'd been in enough combat. I was wounded three times. Third time was uh, I picked up a sack of clothes. It exploded, and I was retired. They sent me home awaiting orders without giving me orders, so I was still a Marine. I still had a paycheck, and that went on for three years. So I couldn't even mentally get back into society. I couldn't readjust. Um, couldn't readjust either because I couldn't sleep. Uh, finally, I went to a doctor and said, I can't sleep. Uh, I can't hold a cup of coffee. My hands are shaking. And he didn't want to hear about the war. Went to a different one. The same thing. No one wanted to hear about it. And finally, I said, what do I have to do? Do I have to draw you a picture? And they said, yeah, draw me a picture. So I did. I drew pictures of combat. And I made these statues. This I made in one weekend. I made it in wax. And it got cast later on. The artwork, every time I did a piece on a specific incident in Vietnam, it would relieve the pressure. So I wasn't feeling it inside my head as much as I could see it. Now it's here. And then I would do more artwork, war artwork after that. Uh, and each time it, was, it would help out. I saw in uh, one of the magazines, I think it was Veteran Magazine, that uh, someone wanted anyone who knew Dan Bullock to contact. I contacted him and he wanted to build a monument. That was Franklin MacArthur. And I told him I knew him and I was with him in the war and uh, he was pretty excited because no one else knew him. And so uh, I built the statue of him, and then I brought it up to New York, 
and his sisters uh, had me fix his nose because um, they said, look, he's got my nose. So I would put that in, sculpt it in. And uh, it looks like him. And it is. Uh, Dan is the youngest person killed uh, in Vietnam. My motivation in relationship with Dan Bullock came with uh, hearing about Dan and also under realizing that he was from Goldsboro and is, is buried here in Goldsboro. I think I have a personal relationship with Dan because I understand his feelings of trying to do better in his life. And he was, uh, and when I finally decided upon myself to, to explore Dan's location and the grave. I'd ne I've been lived here for 25 years and never, never knew his, where he was buried. It was a Saturday and uh, I looked it up and it, it had it listed as being at uh, Willowdale. Well, I, I went to Willowdale and I pretty much knew that it, it wasn't there. and. I realized that there was, um, I knew that there was another cemetery not far from there that was predominantly a black cemetery. And I got directions to it. I knew where it was. I got directions and I drove down there. And uh, it's an interesting drive into that cemetery and there's a new section and an old section. And I went through the new section and the, the headstone is, uh, you, you can recognize the headstone from pretty far away. But at the moment, finding a grave was just a feeling of a of overwhelming sadness and joy that you know there it is, and then immediately I realized that, geez, you know, I can see people have been here, but you know it it needed it looked a little. Uh, Forlorn, it was plastic flowers. One was missing, and the other one was faded. And and, and I, I just pulled up and went over and looked at it and stood there and just there it is. That's the youngest American at 15, and there's the headstone. And this is what I've been reading about, and this is what I see, and here it is. And it this Dan Bullock's grave is exactly two miles from my house. Um, and I, I spent some time there and just re reflecting back because I was in the military in 1969 and I reflecting back to, to I was only 18 and he was 15 and 14 when he went in. Originally, when I went to, to start to, to uh, maintain the grave site, spruce it up, make it look a little bit dressed right to rest. Spruce it up a little bit, you know, just put some pine straw around it and his mother's grave, and, and, and then decided, that, well, fitting to, to put some flags in instead of plastic flowers. And, uh, and then I thought, you know, well, let's get, order some marine flags, you know, just do that. And so I did that. The maintenance is ongoing because of nature. It's, you know, it's, it's just you just can't keep it looking good all the time. So I, I check back you know, from time to time. And I generally go by, you know, maybe you know once or twice a month. Usually on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, uh, just stop by and check on it. And I can tell there are some visitors come by every once in a while. They leave pennies and, and tokens there. Um, but, and my son comes down with me sometimes, but I usually take the dog down there and we just go down and check on things. And, um, a gentleman out of Fort Bragg, a Sergeant Mark McGowan, uh, he comes up every year on December 21st, Dan's birthday, um, and brings his two daughters and his wife up every year, young daughters, to visit Dan's grave. And the reason they come up is he wants to instill in his children the, 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 the sense that the, of sacrifice that, that people 
uh, like Dan, made for their country. Dan was, uh, was raised on a street that's predominantly a Jewish neighborhood and community. In fact, we lived uh, about 10 blocks from each other and didn't even know it. And I decided that our foundation was going to try to get that street renamed after him. So we made the effort and we petitioned New York City, a lot of different Congress people and senators, and we finally got it done. In fact, uh, Chuck Schumer was instrumental in getting it done for us, helping us get it done. Hope still remains in erecting a seven-foot statue of Dan based on Steve's original bronze sculpture. This was never meant to be this size. It was meant to be a monument that you could walk around, actually see it eye to eye with these men. So this would be over life-size, monumental. Uh, that would be nice to go to either the Marine Corps Museum or the uh, African American Museum. I respect him. I wanted uh, to build that statue so that we can all remember him, that, that this young man uh, did the impossible just by getting through boot camp at that age. And I could see it and see that and get to know him. Uh, know, first of all, know that he existed, to know that he died for his country. So I think the best way to honor Dan Bullock and the other Marines who were killed that night and, you know, on other days and nights and weeks in the Anwa Valley is to get it the truth and, and tell the, the full story the best we can, you know, to, to be able to say with certainty or with confidence at least, you know, they were at such and such a place and they were performing a certain mission and it doesn't have to, we don't have to try to drape them in, in heroism and what they were doing was inherently a, a difficult demanding task and, and of course, you know, deserves our, our utmost respect. Dan Bullock's story is a, is a, is a is just a microcosm of the whole war, but it is it is the it is part of the alpha of the of the stories because the youngest and you know, there's the youngest and the oldest, but it's not just the youngest, but but it's the it's the story behind Dan's uh, motivations. Why would this kid do this? Fourteen years old. I think at 14 I was I had a paper route and I was you know thinking about maybe you know trying to make a few bucks or something or you know I wasn't thinking about I was yeah trying to do better for myself but not joining the military so it was just what motivated him I really would have liked to have been in the in the mindset of Dan what was going on there's something had to be going on that had to had to, to make this this child soldier want to do better. I mean, he was a child, 14. But deep inside them, that there really is, there are motivation for kids. Uh, it's tragic that it, it, it happened to Dan, that what happened to Dan, but then again, it, it, it proven a point. Dan was, and still is, one of the greatest patriots we ever had in this country. Because here's a 15-year-old that died fighting for our democracy. And he could have easily threw his hands up and said, look, I'm only 14 in boot camp or 15 and went home. But he didn't. He took his secret to the grave. And since he's, uh, he's a young African-American, he died at 15. Every African-American and everybody in this country ought to know who he is. And I think he ought to be recognized.